announcement of angels. So we've got, uh, again, a series of uh, proclamations. And remember, in the, in the book, we've, we're kind of at the point where we covered the uh, seven churches of Asia Minor. And again, with the opening proclamation of, of who Jesus is and in, in his glory. Again, it's the revelation of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and in telling us about who Jesus is, we find out about future events that will happen that are coming to planet Earth that have all been already predicted uh, in the Old Testament and by other prophets. But John gives us uh, detailed information that to help us understand uh, in a fuller way uh, the picture in terms of future events. Uh, we've already looked at the first half of the tribulation and what's referred to as the seal judgments and then the trumpet judgments where at this point by halfway through the seven year period by three and a half uh, uh, years into it, uh, we already have uh, probably two billion people that have been killed through uh, these cataclysmic events, judgments of God that will come upon the, uh, the face of the earth uh, and that's only halfway, halfway through and the worst is still yet to come. Uh, at that point, we, in a sense, uh, John gives us a, a pause uh, in, the, in the time clock of uh, events. And we looked at uh, events that had to do with the middle of the tribulation, either things that were going on that, that uh, uh, ended during the, will end in the middle of the tribulation, things that begin or take place. And that's kind of where we've been the last several weeks. Now, chapter 14, as we began it last week, we... Uh, pointed out the fact that here now John begins to give us an overview in a sense a panoramic perspective of things that will lead all the way into the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation and that began with seeing last week in the first five verses the 144,000 Jews who have been sealed and protected by God and now we saw them in a scene uh, in the uh, new heavenly city, Jerusalem, the new Mount Zion, coming down out of heaven from God. And there they are with the Lamb and worshiping in a song that only they uh, will sing. We talked about the, what that means in terms of a new song, new in terms of dynamic and dimension because of their understanding of being face-to-face -face with, with Jesus Christ. Now as we get to chapter 6, and we pointed out the fact that uh, this section is broken up by John using phrases like, I looked or I saw. Uh, verse uh, 1 began, then I looked. Uh, verse 6 begins, then I saw. And, and verse 14 begins, and I looked. And each of them really set apart a different section in this panoramic view. And we're going to look at the, the second one here, beginning in verse 6 to verse 13, where we've got announcement by uh, three angels. Verse 6 says, uh, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. So first we would see the angel will admonish everyone to receive the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we first notice that it's a, uh, he will preach the everlasting gospel, and begins with the phrase, another angel, which connects it with the last time we saw an angel. So this is not the first time, back in chapter 8, verse 3, we've got an angel, again, flying through heaven with a proclamation. Uh, so this is not the first time we've seen it. In that case, proclaiming judgment, he's the one that was saying, whoa, 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 because uh, of what was about ready to happen. And again, that phrase, whoa, doesn't uh, mean a lot to us, but to them it will mean you should be scared to death. And he repeats it three, uh, three times because about what is about ready to, to happen. Uh, in this case, again, another angel, another of the same kind, is, uh, is actually proclaiming the, uh, the everlasting gospel. Very important, that phrase, because again, it tells us that the gospel doesn't change. There are people today that say the gospel has changed. The language of the gospel has changed. The meaning of the gospel has changed. And it's a, a very popular idea uh, among many, uh, many churches today. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's tragic and it's unfortunate. Here, uh, again, the gospel that we preach is the same one that Jesus preached, that Paul preached, that John preached. We're still preaching it 2,000 years later. And in the future, when this angel proclaims it, he says it's the everlasting gospel. It's not, it's not going to change. Uh, again, we have uh, those that would say you shouldn't use terminology like, uh, like sin or talk about hell or judgment. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> they wouldn't like this message, I can tell you, because that's, that's a lot of what this message has to do with as we get a little further uh, into it. Those are not pleasant things, but they are the truth. And certainly part of the gospel is the fact that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we are deserving eternal punishment by a God who will judge and punish one day. Therefore, when our sins are forgiven, we are being saved from the power of darkness brought into the power of light. We are being saved from eternal punishment that we deserve, and instead we're saved unto righteousness and eternal life in Jesus Christ. And John will, will make those contrasting points very, uh, very clear. But he begins by telling us about this angel and what the angel is doing is, is, uh, is proclaiming or preaching the everlasting gospel. It's, it's not going to change, should not change. Paul says this of this who uh, seek to change the gospel in Galatians 1.6. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him. Who, has, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. Uh, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before. So now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Now it's it's probably um, almost comes across as somewhat humorous to consider the fact that it was Joseph Smith that believed there was an angel that told him a different gospel and yet he believed it. Now here we've got an angel proclaiming the gospel and saying it's everlasting uh, and that in fact it's not going to change again even though there may be attempts by uh, others to do so. Notice it's to every nation, tribe, tongue, uh, and people. Uh, again, we saw that phrase used back in chapter uh, 7, verse uh, 9 to 17. So it's going to go out into the whole world. It's the everlasting gospel. And secondly, the angel will fulfill God's purpose in the Great Commission because of it going to uh, every, uh, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So everyone's going to uh, have an opportunity during the tribulation to hear the gospel in their own language so they can understand it and respond to the gospel. And certainly there's warnings that are, that are going along with it. Uh, this is not the only angel that's, that's uh, proclaiming a message in the heavenly. Uh, we're going to continue to see others as well, but certainly this one is uh, very important. And is uh, really what Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 24, 14, where he said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The end of what? The end of the tribulation will come by the time the gospel gets out to everyone. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen this in the book, and we've gone through a couple of cross-references, and I think there's uh, every reason to believe that uh, who is hearing the gospel at this point are people that have never heard it before. And we'll give you some statistics, but basically half the people in the world today have never, never heard the gospel, never had an opportunity to hear uh, the gospel. Uh, in fact, right now, the, the challenge before uh, people in Wycliffe, Wycliffe uh, Bible translators and others, even with the help of computer programs, which have really sped up the process, when they find a people group that don't have the scriptures in their language, it takes about 12 years to get the New Testament delivered in, into their hands. It's still not a, a fast process. Uh, there's still about 3,000 languages that need to be translated. There's 16,000 hidden people groups that have never heard the gospel. There's 2.7 billion people or half the population on the earth today uh, that have not heard the, the gospel. And, uh, and certainly God has called us, actually commanded us. We say great commission in Matthew 28. It's really the great commandment uh, to take the gospel into the whole world. Now, we would certainly say, well, just bring that angel on. I think he can do better than we're, we're doing. Well, God's going to do that. But right now, he's, he's, he's basically limited the gospel going out to you and I. And, uh, uh, and whether we really see what this text is trying to say, that people that don't hear it will perish for, uh, forever and ever. God will, will judge. It's a tremendous uh, responsibility. And so we need to, again, be be uh, uh, involved directly or indirectly. And, and the ways that you can do that is by 
Uh, again, getting one of those prayer cards, praying for the missionaries that we have out there. Certainly there, there's many other missionaries in the world, but those are the ones that have gone out. And we're supporting them. Uh, yeah, go on a short-term trip, get a map of the world and put it up. Uh, begin to, uh, to pray for different places and people groups around the world that have not heard the gospel. Uh, there's many ways that you can be involved in missions without going, but either way, we're commanded to take the gospel into the whole world. One day, an angel will proclaim it and everyone will hear, but until that time, it's, it's up to us to get the gospel out. Uh, the second thing, he's, uh, or third thing, the angel will proclaim God is the creator. And I, I thought this was interesting. And in, in, in fact, that uh, this angel is going out, he's proclaiming the, the everlasting gospel. Everybody's going to hear it. But along with it, or it seems like key to it, he's also going to proclaim the fact that God is the creator. Uh, now, when you think about it, there's a lot of people in our own culture, our own society, will very, be very willing to hear a lot of things about Jesus Christ. That he, that he was a, a great rabbinic teacher, uh, that, uh, that he was a, a great moralist. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, hey, there we go. That ended quickly. Praise the Lord. Uh, that uh, all these things that could be said, you know, he, he helped the poor, he fed the multitudes, he did the miracles. And there's a lot of people that are okay with that. But if you want to really get their hackles up, see what the angel is saying here. That there's an everlasting gospel that never changes. That Jesus Christ died for their sins and he is the only way to salvation. And you should know that because God is the creator who is holy and righteous. And everybody can look and see and understand through what we call intelligent design that there is a creator. He is the first cause. He is God and you will have to stand before him one day. People aren't real thrilled about that second part. You know, the Jesus meek and mild, you know, healed and fed and they're okay with that. I say it's interesting that uh, this, this is what the angel will, will proclaim. In fact, Paul says this about this issue of, uh, of creation and, and, uh, and seeing God's power and righteousness through it. Uh, Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness. That, again, the, one of the things that we see here is that with this idea of creation, we recognize that you can see that God exists. I think that's mainly our, our point when we're trying to witness to people that the universe had a beginning. If it had a beginning, it had to have a begin or, and that begin or, or that first cause has to be outside the time-space continuum if he created and so forth. And we make, try to make a, a, a reasoned uh, argument for the idea that you should at least believe that there is a God and that we try to move on beyond that. But this angel, and now Paul, when he's laying this out, when you think about it, he ties two things together. God is the creator, therefore he will judge. <laughs> that's, that's the tie. Again, we don't uh, uh, often make that. Maybe uh, that's not appropriate right off the bat. Hi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. By the way, I need you to know God is going to judge all your sins. I, I don't know that that's the best strategy in witnessing to somebody. Are you sure about that? Well, do you know that he's the creator? Yeah. But in a sense, that's what Paul says. And that becomes the issue why people suppress the truth. Because if there is a God and he is almighty and all powerful and he created everything, then one day I'll have to stand before him and people don't want to hear that. And so because of that, Paul says they suppress the truth. And we live in a day when that truth has never been suppressed. I, 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 it's, a, it's just amazing. You can... Uh, if you bring up the idea anywhere in our country about teaching intelligent design or creation within a school system, people go ballistic. They just go ballistic. There's the name calling. So they don't want to hear about the science. They don't want to hear about the empirical evidence. They don't want to hear about uh, rules of logic. They just, they just go crazy. They suppress the truth. Paul says that they did in the past, and certainly they continue uh, in the future. He says, because what was... Uh, uh, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Mankind is without an excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God 
into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals uh, and creeping things. When man refuses to acknowledge God is creator and therefore they'll be accountable to him one day and therefore ha are suspect to the idea of his judgment coming to them, when they reject that and try to suppress the truth, they will exchange it for something else. They will still worship something. It will be a philosophy or it will be an idea. It could be an actual image that they create. Now, again, in the tribulation, it will be an image. It'll be the image of the, 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 uh, the Antichrist. And certainly there's a, uh, you know, a, a growing sense uh, around us of, the, of people accepting this idea, once again, of, of worship in an image, which is simply illogical, makes no sense at all, that you could build something and create it and then call that your God and, uh, and worship it, but yet it's being accepted more and more uh, in, our, in our own uh, culture, which is an amazing thing. But when man refuses to acknowledge God as creator, he will replace him with something else. Now, back to verse 7. It says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. So to fear God means to put your faith in him. We used to use the expression, oh, he's a God-fearing man. What did that mean? It means he had faith in, in God. Uh, he had a reverence for God. So it's an expression of faith. It's also, notice, an expression of of worship. The angel is saying, here's the everlasting gospel. Uh, God is the creator, and one day God will judge, and you should put your faith in him and worship him and give glory to him. Uh, what an awesome message and to, to hear it from an angel uh, flying. And again, we do know that uh, there's a tremendous revival during this time. It will cost people their lives. They will be martyred for their faith. We've got 144,000 uh, Jews that are sealed and protected by God uh, that are described as the first fruits uh, of their being saved uh, of this revival that will take place. Uh, the word will, will get out despite the fact that God's judgments are being poured out, despite the fact that the Antichrists are persecuting believers and, and Jews uh, around the world. But again, all creation bears witness to God's existence, Paul says, as well as his power and his, his uh, uh, wisdom and it should be apparently a major force in bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. So again, these things are, I don't think it's arbitrary, you know, that uh, uh, we don't hear a, a detailed explanation of every word the angel is going to say. We just know he's going to preach the gospel and tied it with the gospel is the idea that God is the creator, man will, is accountable before him, and man will stand and be judged by him one day. Uh, that might be, uh, again, if you think about it, though, we have a, we have a tendency to not preach that or, or even share that with, uh, with those around us. And, uh, and again, but apparently it's one of the reasons people should respond to the gospel is because God is the creator. So this angel will admonish everyone to receive the gospel. Uh, and then another angel will announce the fall of Babylon. We see that in verse 8. Another angel followed, saying... Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this announcement that Babylon is going to be judged <coughs> in the future, and uh, the word Babylon appears in chapter 16, 17, and 18, frequently called the great city, and we'll get into more detail about this, this future event, this future judgment of the great city Babylon in chapter 17. But well, notice a couple of verses, uh, verses 19 and 20 out of chapter 16. There it says, now, uh, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So again, uh, a, a reference that in a point in time in the future, there is a city called Babylon that is considered great or called great many times, it's going to be judged by God. Uh, chapter 17, verse 5, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of, uh, of the earth. So uh, it's a city, it's called Mystery. It's the, the mother or from where, where uh, this idea of uh, uh, spiritual fornications and abominations to God have uh, have originated. And if you want to trace world religions, 
uh, that are around today, uh, pretty much if you trace them back to their root and their basic belief system, you can trace them all back to ancient Babylon. Very, uh, very interesting. Uh, again, the area uh, close by where Abraham was called out of those ancient religions and to follow God and put his faith and trust in him. In chapter 18, verse 2, it says, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen. Again, our same uh, reference that we've got, which is a quote from Isaiah. And has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Uh, verse 10 later, it says, standing at a distance for fear, for torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, uh, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. So it's going to come very quickly. So there's a city, it's referred to as Babylon. Uh, it's, it's led other nations and other people astray. What it's done is an abomination to God in terms of, again, a type of spiritual adultery or fornication. It's going to be judged in one hour. It's going to come very quickly. This is all still future tense. Uh, then in verse 21 of chapter 18, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. So it's going to be overthrown in a very violent way, very quickly uh, in the future. Babylon, a city that's called the great city, which uh, leads us to, and what city would that be exactly? And uh, I want to give you... Uh, four, four different views, and then uh, when we get to chapter 17, I'll tell you which one is the correct view. So you'll have to come back for that. The first uh, view is not popular with our Jewish friends. Uh, they, there's one view that says it refers to the city of, uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, and the reason that they, they hold that view, some do, is because of the fact that uh, Jerusalem is also referred to as the great city. Uh, on, on several occasions. So you have the link and the language anyway of the two of them together. Added to that, you have had uh, by the Vatican and others for decades now a push, a large push to make Jerusalem not a Jewish city, not the capital, the homeland of the Jewish people, but an international city that is ruled by outsiders. In other words, the European Union with the Vatican, maybe the United Nations involved and so forth. Not really the capital of the Jewish homeland, but a separate international city because after all, it's the city of many religions. Not only Judaism, but uh, uh, Christianity and Islam, and even groups like the Baha'i now have their headquarters, not literally in Jerusalem, but it's right up the coast there off of uh, Haifa. So there are more groups other than the ones maybe we're normally familiar with that would say, yes, Jerusalem should be an international city. If that were to happen, and the pollution that would come with it in terms of bringing these other world religions uh, into uh, God's city, the city of David, you could see how that would be like an abomination to God, and God would judge those in that city uh, in the future. So that's, uh, that's a view, and it certainly has some validity to it. Uh, the second one is that uh, this city is, the, uh, is literally Babylon. It's the ancient city of Babylon that's going to uh, get rebuilt. Now, uh, Charles Dyer wrote a book and, uh, and documented the fact that uh, a number of years ago when Saddam Hussein was still in power and when he was fighting a war against Iran at that time, that in order to kind of bolster the morale of the people, he began to rebuild the ancient city of Babylon, kind of re-replicate -re the Ishtar Gate, uh, some of the temples that were there at one time, uh, and, uh, and did a, a beautiful job on it. Uh, he began to mint coins with his picture on one side and, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar on the other. In other words, here's the great king of Persia, Nebuchadnezzar, the ancient, ancient city, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon and so forth. And he's saying, and we're rising up. We're going to be like that once again ourselves. I don't know if that coin's worth a lot of money right now, by the way. But, uh, but he made these coins. He began to rebuild the city. And so people said, that's it. This is an actual city. This is the city that God will judge and destroy one day in the future. Uh, again, uh, Babylon, Babylon is, uh, is fallen. Uh, now, uh, one of the people that that, uh, that, that, uh, that view kind of went, went uh, uh, quiet for a little bit, of course, after Saddam Hussein was taken out of power, no further work was done in the city. But others like Joel Rosenberg, for example, in his, his books, uh, paint a scenario that, that looked like this. Uh, basically, you've got at a some, uh, point in time in the, in the future, Ezekiel 
38 would be fulfilled. Ezekiel 38 talks about the fact that in the future, Ezekiel said, Russia, along with a confederation of, of Arab states or Muslim states, namely Iran and a few others, would form a pact together. Now, again, they've been enemies for thousands of years. Russia and Iran, they now uh, obviously are close allies one with another. And, uh, and we've uh, had some messages to talk about the... Uh, uh, all the details of that, uh, Putin being in power, remaining in power, and, and, uh, and so forth, uh, and, uh, and what's going on with uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. As Ezekiel says, they will in the future move against Israel, and when they do, God will intercede on behalf of Israel and wipe out two-thirds of their armies. And at that point in time, Russia basically is no more in terms of a power, neither is uh, Iran and those that are with them. Uh, that uh, disrupts certainly the oil supply and many other things that are key to the economic world uh, in the Middle East. But, Rosenberg points out, we've gone in and secured uh, Iraq. They don't enter in. Ezekiel says they are neutral in all this. They are not involved in it. They are not judged by God in it. And they, they then would have the stage to rise to power in terms of economy and so forth. And now, because that's what this... Babylon is, as we'll get into it. It's a world economic system that is powerful. And, uh, and uh, so Rosenberg and others sees a literal city of Babylon being rebuilt. And, uh, and that very well will be the case if you've read some of his books and some of the things that are going on in the world. By the way, when we go to uh, Israel uh, next fall, next November, I think we probably should call it the Ezekiel 38 tour because I think by the time we get there, is you know, uh, Israel is probably about ready to launch their preempted uh, attack against Iran, against their nuclear sites, and, and that may be the trigger to kick in Ezekiel 38. So we could have the best seats in the world. We're not going to watch this thing on television. We're going to watch it right in the air. Just look out the hotel window. What's going on? Missiles are coming in. and See God's hand. Uh, it would just be awesome. There's no extra charge either for being there for this. It'd be a tremendous Time, the Ezekiel 38 tour, uh, awesome. So that's, that's one point. Let me give you a couple of cross-references because Jeremiah the prophet makes a prophet about a literal city of Babylon and God judging the literal city of Babylon in the future to the point where it is no more. And right now there's, there's always been a remnant and a group of people that lived in that area. So Jeremiah's prophecy has not been fulfilled yet. And again, this kind of weighs in on the idea that it's literally the city of Babylon. Jeremiah 50, 35 says, The sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon, and against her princes and her wise men. Then down in five verses uh, later, verse 40, is God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, so no one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. So very, how will it be destroyed in the future? John says, in an hour, it's going to be destroyed. How violently. John, uh, Jeremiah says, it's going to be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That has not happened yet. So all of this kind of weighs to the case that Babylon, Babylon is destroyed. It's talking about a, a literal city. Again, when we get to chapter se uh, 17, we'll see that it really is a world system as well. The third thing, it refers to the city of Rome. Now, this is actually the most popular view and the view that has been held from the reformers uh, you know, through, through the Middle Ages uh, and even premillennialists, uh, even now, pretty much have held this view for a couple of uh, very obvious reasons. Because it is a world system, it is a religious system that is, that is uh, welded or met together intrinsically with the state system and political power and so forth. And that's, that's what you had basically for a, num a number of years under Roman Catholicism through Europe. And if you consider what the scriptures say and what they were going through and the persecution they were going through originating out of uh, Rome and so forth, you could see why the reformers, they all wrote and, uh, and considered this. Uh, again, I, I don't really uh, hold this view, but it is a very popular view uh, by uh, many that write on, uh, on prophecy uh, today. Uh, they even... I think mistakenly there's a, a reference to uh, the city and its seven hills, and uh, Rome apparently has seven hills, but I don't think they're, they're really, from what I'm told, I've never been there, but un unless the sign said this is a hill, you wouldn't really even know that it was a hill, but they kind of liken these things together and through some circumstances believe that Babylon that will be destroyed in this world system will originate out of Rome, 
originating out of Roman Catholicism. And again, part of that is because uh, th there's the belief that as Christianity became legal uh, under the Roman government, 313 uh, AD, under Constantine, what you had is ancient Babylonian religion at that point has made, it, has made its way from Babylon through the Middle East into the Greek culture, into the Roman culture, and was in a sense morphed in and blended in uh, to early Roman Catholicism. So you have this carryover of ancient Babylon. So there's, there's lots of writing uh, on, on it. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of folks that hold that view. The fourth view is that it's an unknown city. It's mystery Babylon, so we don't know. It's a city that will rise to power during the tribulation time. Uh, it will have all those characteristics that we've mentioned, and God will judge it. So we'll, we'll get, this is not the, the last time that we're going to look at, at Babylon. More of the information is given in chapter 17 and 18. But again, there's an angel proclaiming that the everlasting gospel tying it together with the importance of understanding that God is the creator and it's such we should be concerned about judgment. And it's the reason why we should receive the gospel and place our faith in Jesus Christ. It's like one guy said, you mean if I don't put my faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to hell and that's why I should receive the gospel? Yeah, that's pretty much it right there. That is pretty much it right, right there. Uh, and this angel is going to be proclaiming that followed by another angel that is saying, Babylon's going to be destroyed. This great city that is tied to a world system uh, and, and that it's going down. I think Christians need to hear that as well. If we hear the message and accept the message of the first angel, we certainly need to understand the message of the second angel that there is a world system that we don't want to tie everything we've got into. We have to live into it. We've got to be able to function. We've got to be able to go to work. Uh, and so forth. God hasn't called us to, you know, run out and, and live in a little bubble community somewhere with only Christians and go Christian banking and Christian grocery store and only wear Christian socks. And somebody gave me some Christian socks for last Christmas, the reason I mentioned that. Uh, but, you know, but, you know, that's not what God has, has called us to. We're, we're part of it. We're, we're in the world, but not of the world. And I think sometimes Christians understand the message of the first angel uh, without really accepting the, the message of the second angel, which is this world's going down. You know, think of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Where was little Pilgrim leaving? He was leaving the city of destruction, and he was trying to get to the heavenly city. And we're on that same pilgrimage. We're leaving one behind for something that is yet future. So secondly, there's an announcement that, um, again, the world system will be, uh, will be judged. The, the reason that it's uh, going to fall is given. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And again, that's something that we'll look at in more detail in chapter 17. So two angels so far. One admonishes everyone to receive the gospel. One announces the fall of Babylon. Uh, the third one will alert everyone to what I'm calling the greatest danger in the world. And that's in verses 9 to 11. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his, uh, on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. We're going to mention the fact that there's a characteristic of this judgment is there's no mercy at all. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment uh, ascends forever. How long will they be tortured? Forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So it's quite a, again, this is another angel warning Warning people, no one will stand before the white throne judgment of God and say, I took the mark, but I didn't know. No, every, everyone will know. Everyone will hear. It will be in their own language, in their own dialect. They will understand perfectly what they're doing. So the warning is to not take the mark, which, will, again, will be the easy thing. When this thing comes along, this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, this is going to solve a lot of the, uh, the uh, criminal issues in the world. It's going to stop drug trafficking. It's going to stop identity theft. It's just going to be super convenient besides that. Uh, it's, it's just going to be an, an awesome thing. And as we talked about when we got to the mark of the beast, everything is in place for it. And we gave you some, 
statistics and uh, information from press releases from uh, as short as three or four months ago, going back a couple of years ago. This is the movement of the award-winning economics uh, uh, leaders around the world, that we need to go now to a one-world currency. Again, the, uh, we, we showed you a picture and a direct quote from the fellow that is the, the father of the euro, again, uniting the European Union to one currency, uh, and that is his, his whole push, working directly with China today and advising them that what's going to save the world economically now is a one-world currency. Uh, the chip is there. The chip has been tested. It's, we, just, we used to wonder how this would all be implemented. We, we stand at the threshold of all of these things, and yet there's a warning uh, by this angel to not take the mark. There's really two separate issues. The Antichrist will set up his false image and demand to be worshipped. And along with that, then you must take the mark or you won't be able to buy uh, or, or to sell. Uh, and there's a warning not to do it. There's also an announcement of, uh, of God's wrath, notice, and I pointed out the fact that, one, God will not mix mercy with this judgment. You know, sometimes we see that uh, in the Old Testament and other places where yeah, God judges, but he, but he does it for a purpose and he restrains himself. You know, there's, there's still mercy even with his judgment, even in the way he deals with us. You know, he will discipline us as his children that he loves. Uh, but even with, with that discipline, there's, there's still this measure of, uh, of grace. There's still this restraint or uh, mercy shown. That will not be the case. If, do you see the, the language there? He will pull up, pour out the full indignation of his wrath. There's no mercy here. It's just, it's just God's judgment. Uh, now, this... Um, metaphor of pouring out a cup is used in Psalm 75. I want to read just a couple of verses from there, but just point out before I begin to read, it starts out as this wonderful psalm of worship. And then it kind of turns a corner, verse 2. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all of its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully. And to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck, for exult, uh, exultation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down." So again, this is a, a metaphor that's used there in Psalm and in other places. It's used again in terms of this future judgment. Notice the second metaphor. It doesn't get any better. It's fire and brimstone. Uh, and again, images like fire and brimstone, we've, uh, uh, you know, verse 10, smoke, uh, verse 11, upset a lot of people because they try to reconcile this idea of a loving and a merciful and gracious God with a God that would judge and leave someone in everlasting, eternal torment. But uh, God is both holy and righteous, and at the same time, he is loving and, and merciful. Uh, and he makes his appeal. He sends his own son to die a horrible death, to try to reconcile this to, uh, to himself. As one, uh, one preacher once said, uh, if you go to hell, you're, you're trespassing. Because it, there's signs all over, no trespassing. And you've got to get through the gospel and through uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to get in there because it was created for Satan uh, and, his, uh, and his fallen angels and not for man. God says, it's not my will that any perish, but all come to, uh, to salvation. Uh, yet there is the reality of, of both of these things. Uh, so the first thing we note is that in this judgment, there's no mercy at all. And the second thing in this judgment uh, is eternal, as I tried to point out as we went through the text. Now, there are those that would say uh, the, uh, the word that's used here, the root of the word that's used here in the Greek, just means a time period. So there are those that are going to be judged. It's going to be horrible. There, it's for a t just a time, a season. And then you got all kind of other views after that. They're annihilated or they get another chance to, to hear the gospel again and so forth. One very popular writer within Christianity today uh, uh, wrote a book that, to try to appeal to people understanding God better and, uh, and so forth, very popular. But his theology uh, is that uh, after death, everybody gets to hear the gospel again 
uh, and in that state uh, that they're in after death, then they can clearly see Jesus and the gospel, and, and everybody's going to receive uh, the Lord. Now, th there's all these views that are, that are out there, but the, the problem, and I love them. I love that view. It's just that it's not true, but I love the concept, you know, but the problem is it's, it's not true, and we're not helping anybody uh, by, by telling them these things. The same word that's used for eternal judgment is the same word that's used of God, saying that he is eternal. It doesn't mean God's just like for a season. It means he's everlasting. He's eternal. So it's very hard to get around to that. And then people look at these things and say, now, I don't believe that this is actually a description. I think it's a metaphor. Well, that doesn't help because the metaphor is a, a, a basically a scale, scale down language of what really is there. In other words, the reality is worse and we can't describe it, so we're only going to say this. So to say that these things are a metaphor doesn't really help uh, uh, either. Again, does God punish people forever? Uh, yes, he does. If we refuse his offer of salvation, then he does. His love, his mercy, forgiveness, again, uh, are totally meaningless uh, if there is no retribution for rebellion and sin. And uh, and God treasures life uh, that he has given to everyone, and he does not take that life away. People go on, go on living and, uh, in, a, in a horrible state. So it's, uh, it's a very sobering message, and one I think that uh, we as believers need, need to hear. Because there is the gospel that we're aware of, and God is the creator, and with that, people will be held accountable. There is a world system whether we call it Babylon or whatever we want to call it, we're well, we're well of it, and we can get caught up into it and center our life around it and begin to think that you know, at the end of life, he who has the most toys wins. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, the guy that says, you know, I climbed the ladder of success, and when I got to the top, it was leaning against the wrong building. You know, we can, we can uh, do all of these things in our lives and, and, uh, and, uh, and miss the whole point of uh, of what real living is supposed to be and that we're living for a, another place in, in another time. Uh, we can not hear the announcement of the fall of Babylon, uh, and I think we also need to hear the third angel that alerts everyone to the greatest danger of the world. And, of course, in that context, it's taking the mark. Uh, but for us, uh, it's, again, this idea there is an eternal judgment, and, and every person around us that does not receive the gospel will will suffer this. Uh, I don't know if that, if that helps people come to faith in Jesus Christ uh, or not. I, I've been to a lot of, uh, quote, evangelistic meetings that basically were, we used to call them hellfire and brimstone messages, and that's, that's what they were about. There was a, a presentation that was traveling around for a while. It came to Hawaii a number of years ago, had it over at Castle High School called uh, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Any, anybody that's going back a few years, anybody see that one? But... Uh, it's effective in a sense because you've got little skits, dramas that are acted out of, uh, you know, here's a family, they're driving along and uh, they're talking and you become keenly aware very quickly that dad uh, doesn't know the Lord, but uh, mom and the kids do and then uh, there's a car, car crash and now mom uh, and the kids are being ushered by an angel to heaven's gates, right? And then there's a guy that jumps up with the, uh, the red, uh, you know, spandex outfit on and the pitchfork and everything and he's grabbing dad and he's throwing him into the flames of hell and this wonderful family you've just met has now been separated for all eternity well there's that uh, that's going to happen and, and it's one scene after another and uh and, you know, and then, of course, they give an altar call. There's a lot of people that respond to the altar call because they, they want fire insurance. You know, they, they, I want door number one. I definitely don't want door number two. And there, there's a reality to that, a truth to that. But, uh, again, salvation becomes as the Holy Spirit works in our own hearts to show us our sin and that we need to be forgiven. And we place our faith in Jesus Christ and are saved by his grace alone. But uh, again, there's, uh, there's a tremendous danger that are out there that uh, uh, maybe we need to be the angels, admonishing to receive, uh, announcing the fall of, and alerting everyone to the greatest danger of the world. But that's going to cause, uh, we're going to need something else, and that's in verses 12 and 13. There'll be a special ability required of the saints, and I think we need this as well. Look at verses 12 and 13. Here's the patience of the saints. 
Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So the saints, the believers, are required to have, uh, have patience. Now, there's something uh, interesting here that John does in the original Greek text. And what he does uh, in order to kind of like, I hope you see this, you know, if, if you're reading it in the original language. And he puts, a, uh, we would say in, in English, a definite article like the, but it's just an article. He takes uh, an article and a noun and goes article uh, adjective and he combines them. And it's very unusual if you begin to uh, kind of search on your computer and stuff. But it means there's something special that he's about ready to say uh, when, when he talks about the saints, the patients. Uh, he says, look at about what I'm ready to say here. I think what he's saying is that look at the contrast between verse 11 and verse 13. There are some who will never rest, right, because they're judged. And there are others who will rest for all, e- all eternity. There's a, there's a huge contrast between those that have receive the gospel, those who have not received the gospel, and those that have received the gospel, uh, they need patience, uh, patient uh, endurance. One writer said that, they put it this way, patience is the ability to endure difficult times uh, and that it's rooted in the rewards one can expect for enduring because he couples those two things together. It recalls for patience endurance. Why? Because you're going to get a rest and you're going to get a reward. So therefore, (laughs) <laughs> tough it out, man. I mean, it's, it's going to get worse. It's getting worse for, for us to be a Christian in this country, certainly. It's going to get worse as we get closer to the time of the tribulation. And I think we're getting closer to that all the time. And that's why we need to kind of heed these, uh, uh, these words here. But uh, again, here is the patience of the saints. Uh, notice it's those who keep the commandments of God uh, in the faith of Jesus. What are the commandments of God or the commandments of Jesus here? Well, there's actually um, several hundred in the New Testament as opposed to the 16, uh, 613 in the Torah. But the commandments of Jesus are, are things like, don't be afraid. You know, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Those are the commandments of Jesus. That's, that's why it is the New Testament writers say that, that his commandments are not burdensome. You know, they're, they're light because they're meant to draw us deeper into a relationship with him so we can walk with him and learn of him and be under his protection, be under his blessing uh, and so forth. Not, not a burdensome kind of, kind of thing uh, at all. Keeping the commandments, again, a frequent description of, uh, of a New Testament believers. And again, it refers to our allegiance, our loyalty to the, uh, to the Bible itself. Now notice, secondly, the saints will be rewarded. So again, uh, John intends us to see the contrast between verse 11 and 3. No rest for the wicked, eternal rest for the saints. And he does it by giving us a beatitude. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Uh, again, similar to some of the beatitudes in, uh, in Matthew 5. And we're truly blessed if we, if we know the Lord. And, uh, and you know the difference in going to a funeral, a memorial service for someone that knows the Lord and someone that doesn't know the Lord. Man, when they don't know the Lord, it's just hard. It's just a tragedy. The whole thing is a tragedy. Uh, but for the person that knows the Lord, it's difficult, certainly. It's difficult if they're close to you and you love them and you're going to miss them, but you know that it's only for a time. And you know it's a blessing for them. You know, no, nobody's in heaven saying, I hope they'll pray for me to come back. No, they're like, don't, don't pray for me to get revived. I'm, I'm good right, right here in, uh, in heaven with, with the Lord. Their rest is, uh, is eternal, and, uh, uh, and, they're, 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 uh, and there's a reward that goes with it. Nothing that we've done for the Lord will be uh, overlooked, and, uh, and we're going to be with the Lord one day. Uh, Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and the labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, uh, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. In other words, yeah, God's not going to overlook any little thing that we do for him, uh, and on his behalf. I think this idea of patience uh, endurance is, uh, uh, is very helpful for us to understand. I, um, I know that um, uh, a lot of you have been praying for me because my vertigo thing, and I can tell you that I'm, I, uh, I took the test uh, on Monday, uh, and uh, 
and I'm totally healed. I went with Dr. Strat and uh, during surfing, and of course the test is actually, to, can I stand up on a surfboard? I can proclaim I'm healed if I can't surf. You know, I've still got this little walking down the hallway, whoa, 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 you know, loosen my balance thing that I had for a while. And uh, so I really tested it and of course fell on the first wave, just a test of course, to make sure that I could tumble around underneath the water and still come up and not have the ocean spinning. And uh, praise God it wasn't, and I did, by the way, but uh, it wasn't due to my lack of balance. But uh, nonetheless, you know, when you go through a prolonged illness, it, uh, what is the troublesome thing is not knowing the end. You know, and, and uh, there's a lot of you that have suffered different things, and it's like you're taking your test, you're seeing the doctor, you're doing what you're supposed to do, and, uh, and, and you kind of get the sense that Okay, they don't really know. <laughs> and, th and then when they don't know, they like to use words like syndrome. And then you go home and you Google that. It means, uh, that means, I don't know. So it's like, you have this, 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 syndrome. That means uh, we don't really know. And, uh, and you, you kind of figure that out as you're, as you're going along. Uh, and, it, and it makes it more, more difficult because you don't know when it's going to end. You don't know the outcome. And that... Uh, and I, if you've ever had a prolonged illness, all those people are saying amen in, the, in, in, their, in their mind. And uh, anyway, of course, I didn't hear any amen, so I'm assuming there's an amen somewhere in your mind. But uh, none the, nonetheless, if somebody could tell you this is going to be your symptoms and they are going to last for six months, and on the day of the sixth month, you're going to be 100% completely healed, would that help just a little bit? I think that would help a lot. I mean, I think I, I could do it. Do you ever have to take an MRI? Oh, man, the people, somebody asked me the first time I did that, are you, are you uh, claustrophobic? And I said, oh, no, I don't think so. I, I saw this machine on television. I think it must have been a CAT scan. It was about like this big. That's what I think an MRI is. You know what an MRI is? It's a cannon. It's a leftover cannon, and they stuff you into it. <laughs> and you're wondering if somebody's going to hit the button and shoot you out of that thing or not. And uh, it's, 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 it's this big. It's that big above my forehead. And they kind of shove your feet to, you know, get you in there. And, uh, and I just thought, when I looked at the thing, uh, you know, and of course, I'm having vertigo. What is the worst position? Laying down with my head completely flat. Completely flat. They strap it in. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, how, how do I make the room not spin? I lift my head up. That keeps me from spewing forth in the King James. <laughs> So now I'm going to get shoved in the cannon with my head strapped down, and I'm thinking, this is not good. So I tell the guy, I don't think I can do it. He puts me in, he starts to push the button, and I said, how long is this going to take? He goes, oh, about 45 minutes. I go, absolutely, I can't do it then. <laughs> he goes, you think you can do it for three minutes? All right, three, I think I can do anything for three minutes. So he, he puts me in there, and of course, then the jackhammer starts, you know, that boom, boom, boom. You know, they give you headphones with music, like you can hear it, right? <laughs> That's really, really good, really good. Thank you, thank you. And that pounds away on your head for a few minutes. And then the guy, you know, pulls me out in three minutes. He's like, he's like okay, do you think you can make it like uh, about five minutes? I said, uh, okay, five minutes, you know. And, and that's how we, I got through this. Okay, we're going to try six. And it's like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm singing worship songs. It's what I'm doing. <clears throat> and I know they run about three minutes. So I figure by the time I finish the worship song, that guy better come and get me out of this thing, right? So I sing the worship song three times. So I'm hitting that button, right? Like, get me out of this thing. The guy comes back out, and I said, hey, what are you doing? You said, you know, seven minutes. You know, that had to be at least nine and a half. You know, I didn't tell him I sang three worship songs. But I said, that had to be at least, uh, uh, you know, nine minutes. He goes, oh, yeah, you were doing so well. I figured I'd just leave you in there. <laughs> Not good. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. If we know the length of time, then we can patiently endure uh, because it's not going to get easier as we get closer to the tribulation, and I think we're getting, getting closer. And people need to hear probably all of these messages. They need to hear, uh, and, and you say, well, let the angel tell them. No, that's, God's given us uh, the commission as well. Uh, the everlasting gospel. God is the creator, and with that, knowing that, and everybody knows that, everybody will be accountable. There's a world system. Call it Babylon, wherever you want to call it. It's going down, and we, that's not what we want to be investing our lives uh, into. The only things that, that really 
really survive uh, that are in this world now, if you think about it, are people and God's word. Those, those two things. That's what you want to invest your time and energies and in, uh, in efforts in. Uh, and then this idea of, of judgment. I think we need to hear that maybe sometimes more than unbelievers. We realize it's a very short time and the stakes are very, very high. And so John says, it's a, it's a finite time. It's a limited time. So patiently endure. Because after all, there's going to be rest and there's going to be a reward. You ordained the sun to rise and fall. 